writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. In this episode of Right Pack Radio, we continue talking about promotion. Today, we're going to talk about tracking the results and knowing what's working. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of God knows what. Anyway, I uh, was sorry, just doing crazy things. Positivity, remember? I know. Positivity. <laughs> I was being positive there. Anyway, sorry, no. <laughs> Uh, president of St. Louis Writers Guild, President of Winding Trails Media, voice actor, martial artist, martial arts instructor. <sighs> no wonder I don't have time for much. And with me today is my lovely co-host, which I forgot to say that word in the last one. That's one of the few episodes that don't say it. Hi, my name is Kathleen Cayende. I write speculative fiction, and uh, you can find my stories in Lightspeed and Nightmare Magazines and... Um, uh, Jonathan Strahan's Volume 12, The Best Science Fiction and Fantasy of the Year. You can also uh, find me at ReaderCon in July, where um, my story, You Will Always Have Family at Triptych, it has been nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award, so I will be at the award ceremony there, and you can catch me there if you are, you know, in Quincy. And also with us today is... Hello, my name is Jamila H. Chan. I write speculative fiction and literary fiction when I'm feeling particularly churlish. Um, I'm also going to be beginning a creative writing MFA at the University of New Orleans this coming fall. Yay, I didn't drag that one out of you. <laughs> also is the Sky Captain Pirate whatever uh, Steampunk. <laughs> I keep yeah. making, I keep giving him different ranks on each one of these. So I'll it's like Captain Captain and above. I get I promoted like and demoted. It's over. Yeah. Just like Kirk. I'm the Kirk, yeah. That's steampunk. Anyway, so yes, I'm Brad R. Cook. I do write steampunk. I write other things, too. Uh, but you can find the Iron Chronicles out there, all three of them. I even have a great deal on my website where you can get all three books, two prints, and a, and a gear pin. Uh, so go check out all that uh, at bradrcook.com. And then definitely be on the lookout. I've got some new short stories out there. And Tales of the Gear Blade will be dropping later this year. And also with us is my person in competition, a.k.a. my wife. Hi, I'm Melanie Lucas. I, um, hmm, let's see, we're recording in the past, and guess what? We This was the second of the two part. I'm loading now the bag, so we right. are exactly in our contest where we were last week. So, uh, yeah. yes, so uh, I am working on a fantasy novel. Wait, 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 Who, who's winning? At right the now, technically, yeah. she is, Ooh. but once Gateway Con's come and gone, which by the way, we were, we were actually recording this before Gateway Con, once it's come and gone, then I can actually say the, say the gloves are off. Ooh, I don't know. She's don't, winning right now. She's got a long. She's got a very, very far, she's winning far right reach. Now. And... Just let her have this. <laughs> oh, I do. I do. <laughs> yeah, he still has the advantage, even though he's behind. The, mm. Sort of like the tortoise and the hare, and he's definitely mm. has the potential to shoot ahead. We'll see what really happens. On. Right now, I think she's gonna win. But <laughs> and also with us is the Michelangelo of Leonardo da Vinci of the Charles Illustration World. <laughs> I'm trying to start naming female artists. Like I'm trying to... Well, okay. George, I don't know. I don't want to compare... Michelangelo. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Michelangelo. Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. Good save. I've really got to really look up Red Slug's female uh, authors. Well, the, the sad bankers. fact is that women have had a bad rap. Yeah. Yeah. We've had bad opportunities in the past, especially the distant past. But they don't, no they don't not exist. Uh, that's a topic for another time. Yes. Um, my name is Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. My fantasy novel, Threadcaster, and a collection of short stories in the Threadcaster universe are all for sale up on Amazon. Please check them out. And on the Threadcaster website, I have a children's book called Dog Park, which is up, and a sequel, which I hope is up, uh, not for lack of trying. <laughs> so check out Dog Park, which is a cute picture book about dogs making friends and second chances. The, uh, let's see, it's, we're in the middle of July, so also keep an eye out soon for the second Pirate Princess book, which should be launching late in August. And one thing that she doesn't say, she didn't say this last time, and I let it go, I'm going to say it again, 
Because I'm happy for her and proud of her. Mm. Even though she's like, well, I was only number five. <laughs> um, in 2018, she was named, uh, in the top five anyway, favorite children's writer, children's authors in St. Louis. Yes. Ooh, so and that was, in, that was in our... Pay, and our big newspaper here in St. Louis, the St. Louis Post Dispatch, so. and that was voted on not by the writers of the Post Dispatch and editors of the Post Dispatch. This was done by the actual readers. Yeah, it was a reader's choice. So yes. that was that was five of a five list. Top five. Top five. <laughs> five. Top five. He's stealing the list. That's the big right. list. Yeah. 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 The list was all, all the t-shirt. children's writers in, in St. Louis. Louis. My, my, so uh, many. My t-shirt says, still on the list, and people need to ask me what the context is. <laughs> well, I just wanted to be said that I am a children's author, and I did not even make the list. Oh, so, so enough said. You're on my list. <laughs> yeah, the enough said. And that's quite all right, by the way. Congrats. That's take, awesome. Take, take the list. I right. am going to shout your acclaims as long as I can if you don't do it yourself. Please do. As Lashana well, said, that's the purpose of a I good host. That. <laughs> Damn, you make my job. You make my job tough at times. Anyway, also with us, and she's giggling here in the background, is our special guest for this episode, Lashonda Hoffman. Hello, everyone. I'm Lashonda Hoffman. I am a promotion strategist. I didn't say it last time. No, you didn't. <laughs> um, I am the publisher of Shades of Romance magazine. We celebrate 18 years online this year. I am the publisher of. Building Online Relationships, One Reader at a Time. It's a book about helping you promote your book. And I write romance, and hopefully one day we'll be uh, finishing up my book, uh, Middle Grade Science Fiction Book. Excellent. What's the, uh, what's the genre? Middle Grade Science Fiction. Oh, Science Fiction. Yes. If you need a book cover, <laughs> I thought you were asking. I thought you were asking. Well, right. what genre of romance? Yeah, that's what I thought you were asking. Huh? What genre was the romance? Um, I write sweet romance. It's very sweet. <laughs> I like sweet romance. That's the like only kind I can read. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about tracking your results and knowing what's working. Um, I'm going to start off this one with a little story of Right Pack Radio. Right Pack Radio has always been a slow build. Um, it was expected to be a slow build. We knew we were niche. We were a bunch of authors who... Just actually, we started with Kathleen's um, writer's table, which Kathleen doesn't go to anymore. Um, <laughs> we miss her. But anyway, she started a little writing group, and we ended up calling it the Write Pack. Where we talk, ended up talking about various different nerdy topics, as well as writing topics. And then I was sitting back going, you know what? Why don't we share this with the world? Because everybody in, in the Write Pack while we're all at different levels, have been highly involved in the writing community. Um, Brad and I have been been president and past president of uh, Stainless Writers Guild. Uh, Jennifer ha- Jennifer currently is the treasurer of Stainless Writers Guild. I'm the secretary. secretary. Of the secretary. Do not I trust me secretary. with that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't trust me with speaking right now. I am a now. production <laughs> major. <laughs> yes. And... Um, Kathleen has been all over the place in the writing world. I'm loving, I love watching her journey. Chanel's getting her journey going. Melanie gets tagged along by <laughs> kicking, <laughs> and, kicking and screaming sometimes. She's more asleep sometimes. Like, I still need coffee, but yeah. yeah. To various things. Um, and Lashonda, who right now is our guest speaker, she has got an incredible background. In the writing community, she used to have her own, ma- or do you still have that magazine? Yeah, it's still, still have your magazine. You're awesome. a publisher, yeah. um, and does all this publishing and promotion. And where I'm going with this is, we started Write Pack Radio. Well, we went on to Blog Talk Radio, and at one time they had had these metrics, and you know we're watching with slow build, fantastic. I didn't at the time think about putting it on YouTube, so right now we're slow building on YouTube. Um, Blog Talk Radio automatically pushed it off to iTunes. We didn't know this for a while, but I discovered it was going straight to TuneIn and a bunch of other platforms, which they started off originally noting how many listeners we were having there. Then they changed their tracking methods to fit more something along the lines of what NPR tracks, and we lost all that data, and I got to watch this go plummeting. The people who were involved with us back then 
in the right back saw me go, oh, God. <laughs> and to this day, while I love Blog Talk Radio for what it does and what we're able to do, and I am able to see where our listeners are around the world nationwide, I don't, I don't nationwide, not your addresses, people. Mm-hmm. Um, we know we know we're big in the United States. We're pretty big in Canada. We're some reason we're big in Costa Costa Rica. Hey, love you guys. <laughs> um, New Zealand, Australia, um, parts of the Middle East, Egypt, um, Jordan, and I'm missing one. I'm sorry. As well as England, Scotland. Norway, Sweden, France, Germany. Why? I don't know. But I love you guys anyway. And there's other locations. I'm able to see this, so that's great tracking data. But I can't tell you what our most popular episodes are. I can't tell you how what what's really out there is working with this. So with that, I'm going to start that off and say, hey, FYI, tracking, tracking data may or may not change on you. And what you're actually looking for. So, Brad, you're already jumping in. So, go for it. And I'm going to ask what what tracking data we use and what, what tracking data you guys use as authors. How do you know if it's working? Yeah, I thought we should start off by cabochetting this as to what exactly we mean by tracking data. Because yep. there's a ton of uh, metadata out there on the uh, internets. Um, so, there's a ton of it. Um, I, I guess the easiest place to start is Google Analytics. Uh, which is probably the end-all, be-all of, uh, you know, tracking your site online, your name online, you know, all of these kinds of different things. You can set up Google Alerts. You can do all of these kinds of things through Google. Uh, Beyond that, there's the SEO work, which is search engine optimization. Uh, SEO work is about guiding people to your sites. Um, So if you see that certain keywords are attracting people into your site, Obviously, those are things to keep track of. Obviously, you have hits to your website. Yep. Um, that's a big one to track. Um, you can see what days people show up on more. Uh, we have an odd one going with St. Louis Writers Guild, and this is fun. Uh, we have more people show up every other day. <laughs> so on odd days, we have more people show up on than on even days. And it's a, it's, a, it's a bouncing graph that goes back and zigzags across. It's a very interesting graph. Um, I can't explain it, why people show up on odd days, but don't show up on even days. So, <laughs> hey, go fake. Um, so there's, uh, and then uh, you have your impressions and your uh, likes and stuff like that mm-hmm. on social media. Impressions are through Twitter. Um, views and likes and stuff like that will come in through Facebook. Uh, you can And likes and stuff and, you know, Instagram and other things like this. But um, Twitter specifically has impressions, and they actually have a really nice analytics that you can jump into and see how many people saw that tweet, how many people clicked through the link on that tweet, uh, how many people, you know, interacted with that tweet. Maybe they just clicked on a hashtag or maybe they clicked on the actual website or something like that. All of that gets tracked and then you get kind of a monthly report from Twitter that you can go in and see what's happened over the last 30 days. Um, So there's a ton of analytics out there for you to salivate over um i would throw out as a warning to not solely focus on these numbers entirely because you will go insane (laughs) trying to you know worry about oh did i get you know i got 47 hits last week but this week i only got 45 oh no what did i do wrong you know that's fine you know there's nothing different between those two or anything like that but uh those are some of the best i'm sure there's a ton more that we'll talk about over the next hour but uh, in a in a nice little ball, that's probably some of the best analytics you can go out there and see. I'm going to say real quick, we live in it. We live in an interesting time with metadata, in the grounds of your biggest curse. There's two big curses in the world when it comes to data. One's not having enough, and the other one's having too much. And that's sometimes what you run into here. So with this, um, I'd like to go ahead and find out. You know what? What are some of the data that you use or what sort of data you're getting that you track, how do you determine your success? What, are, are you a failure? I don't think anybody here is a failure, but you can see my book numbers. No, just <laughs> yeah, but there you go. So, you know, so what, what, what is the important data? And by the way, I will say this. If you go for traditional publishers 
Agents want to know certain data that you have already established. Oh, no, it's it's even worse than that. So anyone in the it. industry can look up your book sales. Yep. Uh, th this is not a figure that is oh, no, hard for I, anyone in the yeah. industry to look up. So if you are an author and you're trying to get into a bigger house or to an agent or anything like that, uh, just know that they will totally look up your book sales. Yep. Um, which is why you should never really lie on yeah, your book no. sales. Um, you know, and hey, sometimes books sell better than others. That's just a reality of this world that we live in. Um, but I would throw out that uh, um, yeah. some of the best ways of like keeping touch of this and, and not going too insane with it is um, to only focus on some of it, to use the metadata to track, help you post, mm -hmm. um, you know, help you define your audience. Uh, a great example of this is GatewayCon. Uh, GatewayCon last year did a ton of Facebook posting and a ton of, every day we were on Twitter and posting out on Facebook and everything like that. And when we finally got back the bio, the the you know the metrics of our audience, it turned out that women were checking out GatewayCon far more than men were, and that it was more of a middle age thing than. And a younger thing. So we, we weren't really getting the older people. We were getting middle-aged and younger. And because of that, when we saw all of that data, and it was about halfway, three-quarters of the way through promoting GatewayCon last year, we switched it up and started aiming our marketing at those groups. And this year, when we started marketing, we started off aiming at those groups, knowing that those were the groups that were going to be seeing us the most, and then knowing that we could move from there and go forward. So what? Uh, that's great. But what else, What Does what metadata help? do you pay? What, what metadata? As an author, what metadata are you paying attention to the most? Is it your book sales? Is it? Let me go, with Jen, and then I'm gonna go back here to Brenless. You got. Well, I have a statement. You have <laughs> a statement uh, left to us from our special guest from the last episode, Bob Baker, who is a a marketing guru. And he speaks to to something uh, just like that. Says there's many different ways or metrics that you could track. That would be the metadata. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to determine which metric is the most important to you. His example that he gives is uh, is YouTube subscriptions. So if a YouTube subscription is the most important thing to you, you want to have a million subscribers, then you focus your effort on calls to action and, and getting people to come in, you know, 10 subscriber gets a con, you know, wins a contest or gets an entry into this drawing or something to drive up specifically that. And then that, that, uh, directs your marketing plan based on that goal. So a metadata goal, um, what you, what metadata, metadata you care about is largely self-determinant. Like it's what you want it to be. The, if I want book sales to be my thing, then I need to be, you know, getting reviews, spreading the... This is just me. This is him mm -hmm. talking. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, focus my attention on Amazon and Goodreads and stuff like that. And um, not so much worry about YouTube. Because subscriptions on YouTube and the attraction of video fans is not what my goal is if selling copies of my book is my primary goal. So use that. If I can find a way to use that to drive toward my primary goal, then for certain. But at the end of my my YouTube channel, you know, my video of my YouTube channel, I'll have a link to my books, you know, go buy the book. Because it's all about buying my book because I want to sell copies of my book. Saying, you know, like, comment, and subscribe, that's fine. But that wasn't my goal of putting up my video. My goal of putting up my video was to garner book sales. Mm-hmm. Brad, back to you. Yeah, so I actually didn't mean to answer this before, so sorry for not doing that. Um, the one that I look at the most is uh, my actual book sales. Uh -huh. um, and you should never obsess about your book sales, but to me, it represents, I do a lot of hand selling, which means that I am standing at a table, uh, interacting with my readers, and selling at a conference or a convention or something along those lines, and I sell a ton of books that way. Um, Less, not less so, but the harder struggle for me is getting people online or, you know, to buy my ebooks or to buy my book without me being the one pitching it to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in keeping an eye on when I launch a campaign, 
And did that result in any sales? You know, knowing those by like knowing that data, and it's not something I get right away because annoyingly they don't tell you when you sell a book. They tell you months later, oh yeah, you sold a couple books. Uh, so because of that, I then have to take knowing that, you know, this book sold at this time and then go back and see, did I have a campaign going at that time and do these things, you know, relate to each other in any way? And that helps me then track what worked and what didn't work. The other way I track that is knowing um, through views or likes or something along those mm -hmm. lines. Um, and I often do through Twitter impressions. So I will know that I launch at a certain time, that tweet. Uh, how many impressions did that tweet get? How many people clicked through that tweet? Did that tweet result in anyone going to my website? Did my website get more hits that day because of that tweet? You know, those kinds of things. And then one of the others, uh, for Tales of the Gearblade, which you can read the first episode for free, um, I have the ability to track maybe a third of everyone who reads that. Uh, there's some places where I don't get that data uh, from the people who've read those free chapters. But there are where I do. And knowing that means that I now know how many people roughly, because I know how many people have seen it and I know how many people have clicked through, I know how many, roughly about a thousand people read those first chapters uh, in the first couple of months that it popped online. That was really cool to know. Like that, those kind of numbers were huge and I'm not used to that on a launch kind of thing. It was because it was free, obviously. Um, you know, people were like free. Um, but uh, these are all the ways that I have tracked my own numbers. So I like sales and then kind of uh, putting that towards some of my impression numbers. Uh, an example of, of choosing your tools poorly and mapping your metadata poorly from my own experience um, uh, as has been mentioned previously, as a hobby, I have a, a fan comic up that is a Babylon 5 fan comic, so there's a built-in audience for it. I'm not earning any money off of it because it is fan. It's just me. It's how I wind out at night and then draw a page of this comic I put it up. Uh, but people seem to really like it. it. It has to be people who already like Babylon 5, and some people who really like Babylon 5 are, are a little famous. Like, they, they're either famous within their own fandoms, like big fans of Star Trek, or perhaps they're, you know, they were involved in the production somewhere in Babylon 5, and they're like, hey, I found this cool fan thing, let's share it. Uh, I had someone with something like 80,000 Twitter followers tweet it out. You know, check out this fan comic. Tweeted it out, and they came to me and said, hey, how are your numbers today? I have no idea. Because I posted on Tumblr. And Tumblr doesn't map hits. So yeah. I had no idea how many... She, I didn't know that he'd done it if he hadn't told me about it. And that's an example of me picking a platform that does not allow me to map my metadata. Now, being a fan comic, it was less important. It was, you know, it's cool to know that it got the attention. But if I was posting an actual comic, you know, like something maybe I wanted to turn Threadcaster into a comic, I wouldn't do it on Tumblr. I would do it on a website that I would be able to actually map my, you know, my goals and my progress and my hits and know what sites are, are moving toward me. Like on YouTube, you can look and see actually what video people watched before they clicked your video. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a cartoon up for Dog Park, which is my picture book, and I can look and see what all these people were looking at before they came over here based on frequency. Like my, the most frequented click-through was from another animated video about dogs. It's like, that's cool. And that if if I wanted to further that one, maybe I'd contact that person and say, hey, are we share a fan base. Do you want to like collaborate or something? Or your video is really cool. Can I promote it in exchange for you promoting my video? Because it looks like a lot of your viewers also like my work. Those are opportunities that I have through, through YouTube. I'll have that through Tumblr. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny you mentioned Tumblr because I'm going to kind of throw this out there. Um, LaShonda said in the last episode about focusing you know you can't be on you can be on every platform but focus where you want to be at basically take where you find fun and one of the things which we do for right back radio is I use buffer now buffer allow what buffer does is it allows me to post what I want to post out to Facebook Twitter 
Um, I can post it a couple places on Facebook and Twitter, um, LinkedIn. Am I missing anything? I think oh, on Google Plus, which is a which I know is a ghost town. I just don't put it that's up there. That's not anyway. one that we would recommend. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, it, it's a ghost town, people. But or hey, Google Plus, at least for fun place. We tried, but at least it's out there. It, it still it creates a little metadata. Hey, maybe With, if antitrust did it comes in for you. For yeah. Facebook, maybe you know. Yeah, but right. anyway, where I'm going with this is I also have to separately, I separately post it in Tumblr, and I'm bad at doing this because of a lot of things that you just said, Jen. Tumblr, I know, is not my, not Right Pack Radio's platform of where its audience is at. Um, we do have some followers on there, yay, but just tonight, just to give everybody an idea, and this is not a plain, this is just fact, doing an episode of Right Back Radio, not counting recording time, but getting the editing done and all the promotion done, getting it up on Blog Talk Radio and up on YouTube, I am doing six to eight hours in one day. So that's taking that away from the writing stuff. So I don't focus on Tumblr that much. That's not my big thing. But that, where I was going with Buffer is it does give you back this meta, metadata that Brad was talking about. So, if you want it all kind of in one place and you want to save yourself some time, Buffer is one option. Um, is there any? How much I'm gonna shoot at you? We've been talking around you, so. Well, I have a couple of tips. One, when you're trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work, is to have goals for yeah. your promotion. A lot of people go into the promotion business with, I want to sell books. And then they're frustrated because they're not selling books. Right. You can come out and, would, and sell one book for the whole month. And that's very frustrating. Mm-hmm. And you're figure, trying to figure out what you're doing wrong when all you're saying is buy my book, buy my book. And so I teach my clients to create goals. What else can you do other than get book sales? Get, you know, get new people on your mailing list. Get new people to subscribe to your YouTube Get new people following you on, on, on social media. You know, people said they liked your Instagram. Your Instagram went to, you know, you the top post or something. You have to have different goals for your, so all, because all this stuff works together to mm-hmm. sell books. You know, if you're only doing one thing, buy my book, you're not going to sell books. And um, so when you create your goals, then you create your campaigns to go with your goals. You know, like you're doing the Rat Pack. Okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna go. We're on, I'm using Buffer, so I'm gonna do. I'm sending out to Buffer. It's gonna go to all these platforms. As for so many platforms, how can you find out what happened on those platforms if you can't get it from Buffer? Mm-hmm. Well, my favorite thing is Bitly links. I use Bitly links, mm-hmm. and I try to create a Bitly link <clears throat> for each episode. So I got I got the platform that I'm on, which is um. I just completely went blank. <laughs> I have it on YouTube, and I have it on, what the heck is the Spreaker? Spreaker.com. That's what I use. Spreaker.com. So it tells me how many people looked at it, how many people downloaded it. My Bitly link will tell me how many people clicked that link to get to that mm-hmm. place. You know, and I, I use Bitly links a lot because it helps me to see if the campaign worked. If the Bitly link says zero, okay, no. <laughs> you know, if I got five, then I'm like, yeah. So you also need to know what is you think is successful. To me, if I when I I used to be the link to sell ads when I'm selling ads, if I sell one ad, I'm happy because somebody said yes, Lashonda, mm-hmm. click. You know, and, right. and I could sell one ad for the whole month, and I'm you know. <laughs> so you so you have to know what is successful for you. You know, when I put my book out there, I didn't expect to sell tens and thousands. You know, I was happy with one, somebody bought it, you know. But I knew that I wasn't going to sell hundreds of books every month. That wasn't, that was my hope. But I knew going out in there that, it, you know, it's a it's a promotion book. The people who need the book, they're not going to buy it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's just how I work. And I had to figure, and I had to figure that out. That, okay, this book is for the writers, but they are not buying the book. Or if they buy the book, then they won't open the book. So it's not helping them either way. You know, and so I had to say, okay, well, what else do I want with this book? Do I want to do other things? You know, do I want to 
go into doing interviews or do I want to go into doing workshops? You know, what else do you want to do with your book other than it's selling? Uh You know, you have to think about them when it comes to and what works, you know. So the first year I did a bunch of workshops. I did a lot of interviews and stuff. I made money that way. I was like, okay, (laughs) another stream of income from this one book, you know. And so you have to look at different ways that you can take your book to the next level. Because it's not going to always be about buying the book. Because sometimes they might not be ready to buy the book. So you got to come up with other things that that you feel are successful for your book. And a couple of things. One thing I'm just going to go straight off the bat with what you just said. You don't know. I, I know when you've done a promotion, and Brad, you talked about your promotions. When you've done a promotion, and maybe you don't see any sales right away, or you don't see any movement on the proverbial promoter meter that you're following, but if that person may not have been either ready for that book, right. um, they may not have the money for that book at that time, or they might like, hmm, that book's really good for, since my wife's here, that, really, that book might really help out Melanie. I think I'm going to hold off till our anniversary, and I'm going to give her that as an anniversary gift. So your promotion today may actually be the first domino mm-hmm. in a chain going down. Um, before you go, Melanie, I just want to just let, do, do a laugh here. You called us the Rat Pack, not the Right Pack. The Right Pack. And, and, which is funny because I, 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 I held back a chuckle because it was a rat. Well, I mentioned Right Pack Radio in the past, what we kind of created out of. Rat Pack was actually the name that came to me. And I know we couldn't use a Rat Pack. I was like, this, you know, but I played with it. That's, that's just funny. You took me back to the all the time, the Rat Pack. <laughs> Yeah, so I, just, that cool. <laughs> I don't know for sure if Bob Baker was the one that said this or somebody else, but somebody who could have been Bob said that someone has to touch your boat or touch your object, whatever it is, or be exposed to it seven times yeah, on average it, before it buying it. it. So yeah. that's your promotion could be the first time or it could be the sixth time. It's just, you know, you need to get it right. out there. And. Along with this, I'm kind of borrowing from what Brad said and borrowing from what Sean said and others. What your promotion is, whatever you're doing your free promotion, are you providing a value to the people who are your audience? I said this in the last episode, and we've talked about with blogs and so forth. I talked about with newsletters in the last episode. A lot of writers write about what we know, which is writing. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I'm writing a book on writing... Good job. That's fantastic. Yay. But if you're writing, and okay, this is the current book I'm working on. I haven't really talked much about it, but I'll go ahead and give you the premise right now, which is a a former spy becomes a reporter, has left the industry to get the heck out of the politics, and ends up, as a reporter, getting caught up in the middle and accused of a political as well as racially motivated assassination. She's framed for it, and she's got to figure out who did it, get out of it, and start finding out, finding justice. That's not a real long line I'm going to end up using. That's just topping it. So, do you think my audience gives a rat's butt about writing? No, so I've got my writing done. They're good. They care about other things. And so that's, I stopped doing writing stuff on my newsletters. I'm aimed at other things, like self-defense. Which, by the way, thank you, Brad, for being my... Uh, my partner dummy with that, yes. where I get to attack you. Anyway, <laughs> um, so what are some things we haven't heard from um, my lovely co-host over there? Who, so I'm just curious. I know you don't talk much about promoting yourself, but what are some things that you've done or could do? Or So um, I... The, the whole promotion and the idea that I need to be on social media and make of myself a platform has been something that I've wrestled with for a while. Um, I, I had a teacher at Clarion named Ted Chang who's doing pretty well for himself. Like his, his short story, a uh, story of your life was adapted into the, the Hollywood film arrival. And like, he is nowhere on social media. And I'm like, can I just do that? Like, can I just be successful and not have to do all that stuff? Because that takes so much energy. But, like, I don't know. Like, 
I have a website. I, I don't really look at it very often. Like, I am the worst person to ask about this topic. So I'm just kind of soaking things up right now and trying to figure out if I'm actually going to follow through on any of it. Because I have, I have like, the number of spoons that I have in a given day to do anything um, is, is nil, pretty much. Like, in our previous promotion episode, LaShonda, you were talking about, basically, you have, like, five full-time jobs. And I'm like... <laughs> And you were like, and I get home and I would want to sit on the couch. And I'm like, that's my life. That is, I get home and I can sit on the couch and I try to tell myself it's okay when I go to bed to go to bed, you know, like, so, so I'm just kind of soaking everything up right now. Like you guys are in advanced stages of promotion. I, I think, like I, I've said before when we went off the air that overwhelm is our problem. We do that to ourselves. Yeah. We tell ourselves. We have to be on social media. We have to have this website. We have to do this. And each person is different. What works for LaShonda might not work for you. You know, and you have to, you have to find your ba- your balance when it comes to promotion. Like you said, the man, he's, he's successful. Well, so we didn't have social media all the time. Writers were writing way before social media ever came into the picture. We use social media as a clutch because we don't have to go out. Back in the day, as I used to say, back in the day when I became a writer, you met writers at events. You ain't talked to them online. You didn't. If they wrote you a letter, it was, woo, you know. Now you're talking to, you actually can talk to your favorite author online, and hopefully they might respond back, you know. But we have gotten to the point where we think we have to do all this to be a great writer, and you don't. You have to find what works for you. I have one of my... I'm, She's probably, I'm not going to say her name, so I'm going to shut her up completely out. But one of my butterflies, she sells print books, lots of print books, but she doesn't sell a lot of ebooks. And she was upset about that. I said, girl, you get $15 a book. You get $2 ebook, $1 ebook. What do you think you need to sell? I said, don't listen to the people who ain't selling nothing <laughs> trying to tell you what you're doing wrong. If you are selling books, that means it works for you. If you are getting, as I used to say that, I say this to my client, if you're getting a Starbucks book, Starbucks, is it Starbucks? Starbucks? Starbucks. Starbucks, I don't see, I don't even drink that. Starbucks, royalty check, $5 every month, then you need to pick up your stuff. You know, you need to pick up your promotion. You need to do something different. Social media might not work for you. Face-to-face probably will. You probably can sell 50 books at a table, whereas you on social media every day and not sell anything. So you have to find what works for you. He might sell tons and tons of books in person and never sell an ebook. It just that's just how it works. So you have, if you don't want to do social media, don't do social media. There's no rule that says you have to do social media. It's all about how you want to engage right readers. I have like I told you, I had a friend that took her 10 years to get on social media. You have to decide what works for you. If you're not going to do social media, what else are you going to do? That's the question that you have to answer. How are you going to reach new readers? You can't reach it on the couch. Believe me, I've tried that. It didn't work. (laughs) They just don't come over my house. (laughs) (laughs) That might be a good thing. I'm just saying it. You know, but how are you going to reach readers? Like with the person that you're talking about. He might have had a publisher that pushed him out there a little bit more. If you're self-publishing, you're the publisher. So you got to push yourself out there. So you have to figure out how you're going to reach these readers so you can become big time. You can have one reader and be happy with them. You sold one book. But most of us want to make some more. <laughs> you know, we want to sell 200 books, 300 books. You know, but that's what you have. That's the question of what works and what doesn't work. What is it that you want to do? I don't want I don't want to be on social media, LaShonda. I hate it. I hate that that wastes too much time I could be right. Write your books. Then figure out how you're gonna sell. Right? Uh so yeah, and that's actually great advice. And to be perfectly honest, you don't have to use social media uh to sell yourself. Um there are specific things you have to do then. Uh, and the biggest one I would say is something you're doing, which is contests mm-hmm. and anthologies and things of that nature. Yep. You're still getting yourself out there and you're still promoting yourself and you're still doing those things. You're just doing it through winning awards mm-hmm. and being in uh, really awesome anthologies and stuff like that. That is the 
same thing as any other type of promotion you're going to do. Um, it is, you know, if, if your story wins an award, people are going to pay more attention to it, you know, and all that kind of stuff. The, the optimization, the max size, the max, the maximization of your, uh, uh, push though, would be if you could have those kinds of accolades and then push those accolades out to even more people than the people who pay attention to who won that award. Because by winning an award, not only are you getting the little blurb that you get to stick under your name, an award-winning author or whatever, uh, but the people who pay attention to that award, uh, they now have seen your name. And that's an entire form of promotion uh, that is actually a really effective way of promoting yourself as a writer in this industry is by winning the good contests and the big ones. And, you know, if you can place or, you know, like if you're writing mystery and you go after, uh, what is it? Uh, I can't even think Which of one? the name. The Edgar Award? Yeah, the Edgar, uh, the Edgar Award. Um, you know, there are, in almost every genre, there is a big contest uh, that you can enter or win or whatever. And by doing that, um, Yes, it is awesome to be able to say award-winning author or best-selling author. Those are great little tags to have under your name, and they do mean things. Um, but the beauty is, is the people who keep pay attention to that, and then the people who see it beyond that and go, oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's like an automatic validator. Um, and in that, it's a great promotional tool. So, where do we go from there? How else? How else? Win a lot of contests. Win, <laughs> so go out there, win a lot of contests. Good luck. Um, what are some other ways that you guys test that test whether or not your promotions are working or whether or not what you're doing is working? I mean, I, okay, I'm going to throw out the whole entire caboodle here. If that's really work. Your story writing. How how do you know that's actually working? I'll tell you how, before I pack radio itself, and I know, Brad, you've had these moments, and so has Jen, because you've told me these moments, whether or not you are going to share this online <laughs> here or not, it's up to you. So I'm going to talk about where I pack radio. So one of the things, as before, my, meta, my metadata, it's hard to tell. Um, we don't get that many comments. We don't get that many reviews. We've got one bad review on iTunes, and that's the only review we've ever had, and that was from our first season. We're five seasons in. Things have gotten better. I can tell you that much right off the bat. But some, sometimes we have gotten comments. That's really what hits us. Like, for example, you've helped me respark my writing career. Boom. Mm -hmm. We've done our job. Right. So what about you guys? What are some of the things from writing? Brad, thank you. Uh, well, I will throw it out there. And if you're <laughs> listening, hey, guys. Um, so shout out to everyone who comes up to me at Archon, mm -hmm. uh, just right there. So Archon is the kind of big local uh, sci-fi convention that happens here in St. Louis. It actually happens over in Collinsville, Illinois, but hey, you know, that's roughly the St. Louis area. They consider it St. Louis, so exactly. may as well. You may, mm -hmm. If you're in any other part of the country, you say the St. Louis area, because if you say Illinois, they think you're from Chicago. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the point is, is that, um, so every year, uh, for the last several years, I've gone to Archon, and uh, every year that I go there, I, when we're setting up the tables, or at some point somebody's going to come up to the table, and they're going to be like, uh, hey, I heard you on the Right Back Radio. And in fact, the, uh, the one year, I was in, like, just walking down the hall, and some dude was like, Brad! <laughs> and I was like, hey! He's like, Right Back Radio! And I was like, yeah! <laughs> and I was like, I mean, it's, it's just, it's stuff like that. And that is that is great to hear. And it's great feedback. I love it. You know, it's awesome. But it lets you know that people are definitely listening and people are tuning in on a weekly basis. Heck, one of them has now joined the, uh, you know, on a regular basis. George. Yeah. Shout out to George. Yeah, yeah. George yeah. is, an ele he's an elevated fan. Exactly. He began oh. as a fan and became a regular commentator. It might I say so is Ryan Freeman. Yeah. That's true too, so, right? Yeah. It is as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it is the kind of thing where hearing that kind of feedback, getting that kind of direct feedback is awesome. Uh, I would also throw out, so I am uh, mostly a middle grade and YA author. In doing so... I actually don't get to talk to my fans all that often unless I'm doing a school visit or mm -hmm. I'm doing mm -hmm. an event because 
your average 10 to 12 year old or a higher is not on Facebook, is not on my website. You know, they hopefully have parental controls on their, you know, internet still or whatever. Please. But, I wouldn't bank on that. Yeah, I wouldn't either. But they should. No. <laughs> Point is, is that, you know, I don't have legions of children as my fan. There is my followers online. That's just not what happens. But... The beauty is, when I do these events, so I have the benefit of, uh, with the Iron Chronicles, it's, it's a trilogy that was released every year. So I had the benefit of having kids show up every year. Uh, they would show up the first year, they would show up the second year, and then they were super excited to come to the third year and to get the final book and all of that. That is amazing. That is direct feedback that I will forever love and take to heart because it is just some of the greatest things I've ever heard. Having a parent turn to you and say, my child doesn't read, but he loves reading your book. That is huge for That is why I write middle grade. That is exactly why I write middle grade. And to be honest, if that is all I ever get as an accolade as an author, I'm good with that. <laughs> because that means I did my job. And, you know, if, if that's... These are the kinds of direct accolades that are really cool to hear, and it's why if you are interested and want to fire off your favorite author, I guarantee you they're going to love hearing from you. But it is, it, is, it is something to take to heart because, you know, like, I don't have legions of fans or the huge amounts of reviews that go on Amazon or anything like that because, you know, my audience is younger and that is right. not what I'm going to get. But I have had more than one teacher text me or tweet me out during the day and say one of their students just walked into a class with my book under their arm. And that is too cool to hear. And the first person, the, uh, which is a, uh, a fan, or like a, a friend of mine's daughter, who's uh, a writer friend, though, so only like an acquaintance, really. Uh, but her daughter was a huge fan of the books and did a whole book report on my book. That was huge. I was like, a book report? That's crazy that somebody did a book report on one of my books. Yeah. So it's, it's these kinds of things that you can really gravitate towards. It's probably the best feedback you're ever going to get as an author um, you know, direct from your audience, uh, because these are your readers. These are the people who love you and love your stuff and they're coming back for more. And that notion that they can, you know, keep getting it or it's five minutes with you or in the case of the one where I'm like, you know, kneeling down to take the photograph with the young girl who's like in full steampunk gear and super excited to read my books because she's read the first two and now she's got the third one in her hands and you can tell she can't wait to get home and crack that open. Those are huge moments, and to be honest, like, you know, as I said, if, if, if nothing else comes, if I never make the New York Times or the USA Today list or anything like that, that's totally fine, because I know that I did my job, and that's really what matters at the end of the day. Um, like I said, my book was in 2015, so last week, someone tagged me on Instagram, she had bought the book, uh -huh. not the, not the e-book, she had a and she had a picture, and she had her notebook, and she's like, I'm getting ready to write my promotion promotion plan. And I was like, nice. <laughs> she tagged me. I didn't know who she was from, you know. I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know who she is. But I was, I, I tell people all the time, books do not have an uh, expiration date on them. Right. This book was published in 2015. It's just, you can still use it. You know, people put it out there. And, and it's cool when you meet somebody that, like with me, I, I can see when I sell a book, but I don't know who it goes to. Right. So it's kind of cool when that person who bought it, they say, hey, I bought the book t today. And then they contact me a week later and you go, hey, I got the book. Here it is. You know? And so that's the, that's the cool way of, you know, especially when you're not selling any books, you're going, like, you know, why am I doing this again? <laughs> you know? And you get one of those. And I, I think God, for me, I say that's a God moment because he knows when I'm really down in the dumps and I'm like, I'm done with this magazine. I'm not putting it out ever again. Somebody will go, well, Shonda, that was the best issue ever. And you go, oh, well, thank you. We'll be back for next month. <laughs> you know, and so that's that's the other thing you have to, like I said, you have to have other things that you that, that get you inspired to, to know that it's working. Like he said, it, most of the people I, I sell books to us are writers. He not writing nobody. Right? Yeah. They won't even. You have to pull a tooth to get a review. Can I get a review? I then then they'll, they'll send me a review to me. Lashonda, I love this book. This really helped me. <laughs> you know, and I'm going okay. 
You can't be mad about that because they did take time to write you and tell you that the book is good. They like the book. It helped them, you know. One of my biggest, for me, that I knew I was successful, I'm telling you. <laughs> I sell lots of books. I'm in the St. Louis Library. Oh, oh. <laughs> that was my ultimate um, it. I didn't know arrive was to be in the St. Louis Public Library because I was a library girl and I your book to be in the library is a big deal I'm in three libraries now nice. wow. oh, one in New Jersey one in Kansas City I think another one in Iowa so that, I'm successful yeah, that's, that's, cool. <laughs> that's cool then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's that's my that was my thing. So my dream is to be in all the, the libraries across the country whenever I get big time, you know. But you have to know what's your success because it might not be money wise. Right. You know, so you have to find that success thing and what works for you. And getting a I don't care how it comes in a letter or in an email from somebody telling you that their book touched you or helped them, that that's worth more gold to me than anything, you know. And sometimes we forget that that mm-hmm. what are we writing for? Because sometimes you get so caught up in, oh, I want to make all this money when it's all about the reader. Because somebody got to read it. <laughs> yeah. You never know when what you write is going to touch. Yeah. So. Well, um, so, was it Angie Fox? She was yeah. talking about, like, um, she's a, a hybrid published mm-hmm. author. Right. So, she's been published by, like, big houses and she's self-published. Mm-hmm. And she, she does her promotion, so far as I understand it. And it was fascinating to hear her talk about some of the the strategies she would use. Like she kind of approached things a bit like a scientist. Like she mm. would she would she would have an idea for a promotion and she would test it in one area and look at all the metrics and decide how to like how to modify it to do better. Mm. Like, do you guys do that sorts of things with your with your metrics and all the metadata that you can get on the interwebs these days? I I um what they call A and B listing. I do a lot of email marketing. And so, you know, the whole thing is to get them to open the email, <laughs> you know, and it's all about that, that sentence, you know, just to say, hey, you know, open this email or, you know, and so sometimes I'll do that. I'll send out a message one day and then I'll, it's the same one and I'll send out a different sentence to see if they'll open it up. And then you can look at your, um, at your uh, open rates and say, okay, well. Some people opened it and some people didn't. And when nobody opened it, then you're like, hmm. <laughs> you know, and so that's the same way with the Bentley link. When you click it and you see nobody, nobody looked at it, nobody clicked the link, hmm, you got to go back and see what, why, why you think the person didn't look, why they didn't open it, what worked for it, or, you know, maybe you just got two links, you know, people opened it up. And then so you go, okay, somebody opened it, so, you know, what I got to do to, you know, make it better, you know, and so. That really is the big conundrum. Why mm-hmm. didn't they click on it? Right. You know, because right. you'll see those numbers and you're just like, no one did. Kathleen, your next, but before you do that, let me just point this out. Now, in my last, in the last episode I mentioned, I've got 13 separate email addresses I've got to manage. Um, just because of everything I do. So, Melanie can tell you, um, the day, what was it, last night? Recording timelines. We're recording in the past. So last night, I was finally cleaning up my emails because I've been distracted oh, yes. by GatewayCon. I deleted over nine thousand emails. Over nine thousand. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And what I'm going with that is sometimes that person may not have opened it because they are inundated mm-hmm. with email promotions or junk included from other things. So. Kathleen, you're next, and then Brad. So I do want to go to that question of why don't people click on links. Like, there is the whole you're inundated with things. There's, Mm -hmm. like Brad mentioned, you know, I sent you an email last weekend, and I'm like, I was at WizCon. Like, I checked zero emails that whole weekend. It's probably buried. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's also, like, somebody posted a thing that's, like, the best time of day to post post on Twitter versus Facebook versus Mm -hmm. Tumblr. So like those are those are a few reasons I can think of like the the time and day you release it but like why else it's it so it amazes me I'm gonna throw out so I did a lot of this kind of stuff with Tales of the Gearblade uh, which I was putting out for free and I very much wanted to know who was clicking on those links um, and and how many people and you know it, because it was free and there's a lot of data to track I really wanted to get the numbers on this so I. I would test it at different times, 
And oddly, the, the one that I found got the most amount of hits was tweeting it out in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because people are up, you know, maybe they're on their phone, and they're like, oh, okay, I can click through, and they'll click through, and then they'll just read that first chapter. Um, so I started tweeting in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Like at 2 a.m. before I'd go to bed, you know, at the end of my writing day. I'd be like, it'd be like 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm sitting there tweeting out my all my publicity for the day. Because it's hitting then. Um, so the first way that I that really comes down to is being able to track those kind of clicks and knowing the best time of day to tweet. Mm -hmm. um, there are graphics and stuff. There's a great graphic out there of when to tweet and all the or when to post on all the different platforms uh, because that's when the people are on there. Um, like Facebook, I find uh, is actually a really effective one to do mid morning ish mm -hmm. because sometime before lunch everybody going to jump on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So they're going to see your post then. You know, and it's it's that kind of, of being able to track that kind of stuff. I noticed that throwing it out in the middle of the day was crickets. Whoa. No one was reading any of my free stuff in the middle of the day. Because they're at work. They're doing stuff. They're running around throughout the day. They don't have the 10 minutes to sit down and read that chapter. And yeah, somebody might favorite it for, or like it and, you know, maybe go to it later or something like that. But, what I found was is that it, hitting the time of day when somebody's most likely going to read, that's when my posts about posting the free stuff was most effective. And it isn't just people directly clicking through and reading. It was also the people who retweeted that because here's free content that I can put on my Twitter that you can now see and it goes out to a ton of other people and everything like that. So... I really found those kinds of things to be super effective. Now, here's the funny part. So, Tales of the Gear Blade, and for anyone who's paying attention, uh, this I talked about this earlier in the year, but... Um, so I released the first chapter for free. And then I put out the second episode, uh, the second chapter, basically. It's, they're more than chapters, but... Uh, I put out the second one for 99 cents. Because episodically, this is what you're supposed to do... You release the first chunk for free, and then the rest of the book comes out uh, 99 cents a piece. At the end of it, you release it as a big-ass book. No one, not a single person, through two launches of this thing, bought or read the second episode. So, I said earlier, around a th I know that about a thousand people or so uh, read in the month or so period when I was pushing the free one. Uh, about a thousand people read the freeze thing in a, in a month. And then that next month, no one read anything. Despite all the pushing and everything like that. And I realized that it was the free thing that was bringing them in. That it was the reading this for free and all of that. That's what had brought them in. And they weren't going to come back and pay episodically and do it that way. So I have dropped that uh, if you're out there. I am not going to be releasing these uh, once a month. I'm going to release uh, the first three episodes for free. And then the rest of them will come later this year and be an actual book, just like you'd see any other regular book. So essentially, I'm releasing the first third of the book for free. Uh, and that will exist from next month until, well, okay, this month, because we're, we're ahead here. Uh, this lie. month, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This month all the way until probably November when the book comes out. So it will have months of people reading those first three chapters. And I guarantee you the people are going to read them. I know for a fact they will because it's going to be free. It's going to be in a nice flipbook format. People really liked that too, by the way. Uh, they really gravitated toward the flipbook for the free stuff. Uh, define flipbook. Since mm -hmm. in my world, flipbook is a short animation told on a <laughs> Okay, good point. Flipbook. Yes, that's a good point. <laughs> good answer. Uh, I'm talking about the HTML5 flipbook, which is uh, a graphical representation of a book mm -hmm. uh, on your... Uh, so it takes your chapter... And it turns it into a online book okay. that has pages that you flip uh, and all of that kind of stuff. And I there see. are, yeah, <laughs> and there are a ton of different places you can use. Some of them are free. Some of them are cost money. Um, I use uh, Flip HTML5. Um, it is a wonderful product. But what I found was just posting. So I've had the first chapter on my uh, website. For months and months. Uh -huh. And nobody read it. Nobody read it. Uh -huh. I can guarantee you, I can see who goes to what page on my website. 
And I, everyone hits my homepage, obviously. And then a few people go back, but nobody in that span went to the page where the free stuff was on, or where the chapter was on. Hmm. Despite posting it around and all that kind of stuff. The minute I put in a flip book, a thousand people read it. Hmm. So it was the difference of scrolling through a website and, you know, like scrolling down and just reading that blurb that's sitting on the website to this little thing that you flipped with your thumb, like you were on Tinder or something. And yeah. in doing that, it would felt more like a book. It, it gives it that appeal and people really gravitated towards it. They really jumped on it. So in doing that, like there's now a flip book for Gateway Con uh -huh. that's had a bunch of reads to it as well. Uh, and stuff like that. So I've, I've created them from all my short stories and first chapters that are all free online. And people will really gravitate towards them. It's kind of been cool, actually. Uh, I don't get a ton of metadata out of them because I don't pay. If I paid, I'd get all data. Uh, but I get some knowing, like, how many people have clicked through my links and everything like that. So it's interesting. Can I just say I really like this? Like... I'm sorry. I feel like I'm getting Why? like behind the scenes for the for the book, you know, like like you have DVD features, but like here's actually why we did it this way. This is why we shot the scene this way. This is why I released the book this. I love it. I'll say don't apologize for that. That's perfect. I love it. I mean, idea oh if I uh, when I get uh, like a few years from now when I get to the point if I choose to try not try and uh, find a publisher but choose to self publish the novel is still in the first draft, so it's going to be a while. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I could, you know, publish the first little part or scenes as a little free thing if mm -hmm. it breaks up into a nicely into its sort of, you know, individual story type thing or vignette. And I guess with that, because we are out of time, we're going to end this episode of Right Pack Radio. Hey, as I always say, um, first off, have a great week writing. Tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. Please share these, share these episodes. With your writing friends, writing community, like us on wherever you are listening. And do like our Facebook page. Leave comments. We like to see these comments. Take care, all. Bye-bye. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.